Zero Hour, we are back. Welcome, it's Mike Mutzel. I'm grateful that you are here. Today we're gonna to talk about how your feeding windows and your fasting windows ought to change with the seasons, which I know some of you are like, wait a minute, you said 16-8 is good, Mike. Early time-restricted feeding is what the clinical studies have shown, especially that article from June of 2019 that showed that time-restricted feeding, just an eight-hour feeding window, even if you eat earlier in the day, was able to increase various longevity and age-associated biomarkers that support health, that support health span and autophagy. So wait, you're, now you're telling me that it's good to change my diet with the change in seasons. Well, my, I'm confused here. So let's sort of unpack this. And as we do talk about this, I would like to share with you an article that recently came across my feed that is phenomenal. I will link this in the show notes. The title here of the journal is Metabol Metabolic Homeostasis. It's all about the timing. Now, as we go into more of a fall, it's feeling very folly around here. I don't know about you, uh, where you are in the world. And for some of you, um, you're, you're, you know, going into a different season, you're going into your summer and so forth. So it's, it's different for, uh, you know, depending upon where you are in the world. Now, what you need to understand is human beings, that means you listening to this, if you're able to intelligize, you know, sort of and understand what we're talking about, you are an animal. You're an animal, you're more sophisticated, you're more intelligent, you have reason and thought and intuition, and you have these different things that say a deer or an elk maybe not have or a bear, but you are still, you should live in harmony with your seasons. Now, if any of you observe animals like myself, uh, I love to go and watch animals, observe them, see them in nature. Uh, I was just out two weekends ago looking for elk and I came across some bears and seeing bears just you know, trying to prepare for hibernation. They're just gobbling down the berries, right? They're fattening up and so forth. Now, what you need to understand, uh, obviously their hormone levels are changing. So if you've heard about the rut with elk and deer and other ruminants, they their testosterone levels peak in the males. And so they're trying to procreate, right? So this happens it, it, in a predictable fashion in the fall, right? So we need to understand that we too are animals. Our hormone levels change throughout time. And our meal timing and our eating windows should change as well. And this is this is not new. Circadian biology, uh, chrononutrition, the circadian rhythm has influenced the timing and the dosages of various oncological medications in chemotherapy for a number of years. We talked about that extensively in my book, Belly Fat Effect, in 2014. So your circadian rhythms are and your meal timing is a byproduct of your environment. So when people say, I eat at 10 and I eat at 6 every day. Well, what about during the winter when it gets dark at four or when it gets dark at five? What about in the summer when it's light out until midnight if you live in Alaska? So it's it's cool to have these habits and these routines, but we also need to modify them with the seasons because you are an animal. Whether you want to recognize it or acknowledge it, if you're thinking, well, I'm a sophisticated animal. I'm smarter than the deer and the bear and the gorillas or the whatever, okay? You still live and should live in harmony with your environment. Where humans have gotten off track with their chronic health issues and all their health ailments and challenges and the obesity and the insulin resistance and the autoimmunity and the susceptibility to COVID and the sleeplessness and the early menopause and infertility, you name the condition. Part of the ailments linked with these conditions is circadian rhythm disruption. As human beings, we think we can circumvent nature entirely because we can take pills. Oh, you have this disease or ailment? You can't sleep? Here's a pill for your sleeplessness. Oh, you, you have depression? You're anxious? Oh, because you're living out of harmony with your environment and you're staying at home. You have no friends, no social connection. You're eating processed food. Here is a pill for that ailment that you're experiencing. So we think we can augment and circumvent nature. The challenge here is when we circumvent nature, it always come back to, it comes back to bite us in the butt. Now, we're seeing here with time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting, we need to live in harmony with nature. So I'm giving you the whole backstory, the very simple punchline of this video. It could be stated in 30 seconds and I could click off and you could go about your merry way, is you need to eat in harmony with the seasons. As the, the day gets shorter, so too should your feeding window. It's very simple. It's easy to say. It's easy to talk about. It's harder to implement because, again, humans have habits. Again, many of you are health-oriented, health-seeking people. So you say, I eat at this time. This is my meal window. We have these regimented routines, but we need to have some leeway, some flexibility in our feeding fasting windows. And part of that le the le leeway should be, again, living in harmony with the season. So to make it, long story short, uh, you know, how should you construct this? Well, it sort of depends on your sleep-wake cycles when you go to bed and when you wake up. 
I, I really emphasize this for all my clients when I do one-on-one coaching. You want to strive to eat no later than a, give yourself a six-hour gap between your last meal and the midpoint of your sleep. So just write down on a piece of paper when you go to bed, when you wake up, how many hours do you normally sleep? Seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, whatever. What's the midpoint time? Is it 2 a.m. for you? Is it 3 a.m.? Is it 1 a.m.? Whatever it is, and then backtrack from there. That should be at the bare minimum. I actually strive for eight to 10 hours between my last feet meal, snack, whatever, and midpoint of sleep. Because when you're eating too close to bedtime, it augments and negatively impacts digestion and motility and, and can cause... We talk all about fasting raises cortisol and cold thermogenesis raises cortisol. Well, guess what? Eating food raises cortisol, right? So if you're if you're really scared of cortisol, this evil hormone made by your own adrenal glands is so bad. I'm kidding. Uh, it's obviously has its it roles physiologically. When the context gets lost in the by the adrenal fatigue warriors, but we need to understand that eating the act of eating raises cortisol. And we know that having cortisol around can create, you know, sort of that wired but tired sort of feeling if you eat too late before bed and so forth. So that's how you backtrack. Again, I want to say it again, figure out your midpoint of sleep and then minus six hours from there and really aim for about eight hours if you want to give yourself some sort of longevity benefits and so forth. So that means, you know, that you're eating earlier. Now, this is easy to do if you're living in harmony with the seasons. If you go out camping right now. And for me, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm out, you know, with my binoculars looking out for animals and, and trying to, you know, see their behavior and so forth. And, and they stop, you know, they, they start to exhibit different behaviors as the sun goes down and it's, they're starting to, to calm down and, and move around, um, around 7 PM, right? It used to be 9 PM. So, you know, it was okay in the summer to have a big meal window because you're in harmony with your season, you know, the metabolic environment. Here's some images so you don't think I'm just like blowing smoke up your rear end. Here's all the different core clock genes. There's a central circadian clock genes within your brain. And then there's, there's a peripheral oscillators that are influenced by the things that you do. Not only just the light and dark wake cycles, but also when you eat, when you feed, when you do all these things. So this is wired in science, friends. I know it sounds a little, a little woo-woo, like uh, meal windows change with the seasons. Like, uh, you know, is there any evidence for this? Uh, there actually is. So this is what's sort of going on here is there's a lot of these different uh, circadian clock uh, windows and so forth and, and intracellular signaling switches that are turning on genes and turning off uh, other genes and much more. So it's, it's based and rooted in science. So you want to, you know, backtrack uh, from there. So here's just, you know, sort of an idea. Uh, yeah, this, this person running, exercise, meal timing, all of that influence the peripheral circadian clock genes and metabolic targets in your body. So this is really a big deal. So we're going to get into that uh, in just a moment. I do want to get to some of your live questions. And so for the, some of you all that are here, I want to let you know that our episodes are brought to you by our sister company, Myocytes Nutrition. One thing that also changes with the season is obviously the intensity of the sun. So as we get closer to fall and even into winter, the sun is still out, the days are shorter, but what's known as the zenith angle of the sun becomes insufficient to stimulate cutaneous vitamin D synthesis. So if you're trying to optimize your health and your biology, you might want to consider increasing your levels of vitamin D from supplements during this time of year. And you can see here from some of the feedback here from one of our customers, Virginia, an amazing customer. She says, you know, this formula has really been effective at improving her vitamin D levels. So you can see the, the, the verified comment there. We have a lot of great comments and feedback on our vitamin D suite of formulas, liquids, chewables, we have capsules, we have soft gels, a, a wide range of different solutions for you and your family. Use the coupon code podcast over at Myoscience. That's podcast at M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. So let's get back to this article and then I would like to get to some of your live questions. So there's a lot of really good uh, information in this article that we're going to get into. Uh, specifically, one thing that I think is quite fascinating, and that's this connection between circadian dosing of different drugs and natural compounds and chemotherapeutic agents. So mainstream medicine acknowledges and recognizes this idea that circadian biology really influences, uh, you, know, you know, metabolism. So the article goes on to say, you know, there's crosstalk between peripheral tissues uh, and how it's essential to ensure the proper coordination of nutrient intake uh, with de deposition and, and during the feeding period and fasting period and so forth, and therefore uh, prevent various metabolic diseases. You know, so they, um, 
uh, you know, kind of get into all these different underlying principles uh, in mammals. And again, you're a mammal and how the brain is influenced by sleep-wake cycles and how there's these different uh, peripheral targets. For example, uh, the skeletal muscle, the fat cells, the pancreatic cells within the pancreas. Um, there's all these, and even the gastrointestinal uh, cells, the, the gut clock, there's peripheral oscillators in all these different tissues. So the circadian clock is an integrated transcriptional, translational, auto-regulatory feedback loop. So it's a feedback loop involving the upregulation. So transcription refers to genes. Translation refers to, to the making of proteins. So this clock is constantly turning genes on or off and making or synthesizing enzymes and proteins in an auto-regulatory feedback system, as this article goes on to say. So it's very important to live in harmony with that. So uh, start to sort of think about how you can um, change your feeding windows with the time and so forth. And I want to get into some of these these aspects of the circadian biology that um, a, a, with regards to medicines. I think this is interesting because when we hear that, wow, chemotherapeutic drugs are administered based on a certain time and the circadian rhythm signature of the patient, then it's like, okay, well, if, if it's good enough for the, the for the oncologist, it's it's good enough for me to then realize that this this is legitimate, you know. And we in the Western world we need so much hard data. Um, so I'm trying to find that piece of the of the article here that gets into that. And, and if you you guys can check out this free article here as well. Uh, okay, here we go. So it's called um, a chronotherapeutic approaches to treat metabolic disease. So chrono meaning time, chronotherapeutic, so time derived therapies uh, to treat metabolic disease. So chronotherapy is used extensively in the clinic with many great dr drugs given in a temporal fashion uh, so as to maximize their effectiveness. So if we think about this, you wouldn't take melatonin in the morning. Why would you do that? That, that would be stupid, right? So you auto, you automatically, you know, based on that, you know that. Now, when would you take blood sugar supportive nutrients, like maybe like berberine or maybe say chromium or vanadium or alpha lipoic acid? Well, you might want to consider taking that more in the afternoon, evening, because as you might uh, be aware, insulin sensitivity, you're more insulin sensitive earlier in the day and you get progressively more insulin resistant during the day. That also means that a walk after dinner is maybe more important or just as important as a fasted walk in the morning. So then start to think about, okay, well, when can I you know, dose these uh, other prescriptive you know, sort of lifestyle uh, modalities like walking and exercise and meditation uh, as well? So it's interesting. So given the extensive evidence linking circadian disruption to metabolic disease, the possible utility of chronotherapy for preventing and or treatment has therefore become uh, of increasing interest. For example, the polyphenol resveratrol reverses the suppression of the hepatic, this is a ARNTL expression, and induction of insulin resistance caused by keeping mice in constant darkness. So it's interesting, like if you, if, you know, if you put yourself in a constant darkness or constant light, you perturb your body's circadian clock, which is really quite fascinating. So uh, they go on to give a bunch of different examples about um, different flavonoids and different things. And so the 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 ultimate take home and the conclusion here is the circadian clock is, is intertwined and impossible to disentangle from normal physiology. Um, and various experts in the field uh, from this uh, coalition of articles published in the endocrinology uh, journal so far in this month, they're going to do a big uh, kind of series and suite. So definitely check out the references uh, linked below. Uh, and demonstrate the essential role of peripheral clock in maintaining me metabolic homeostasis. Uh, it's evidenced not only by the highly synchronized interplay between the gut and its microbiome, which is fascinating, pancreatic islet cells, uh, hepatocytes, which are liver cells, monocytes, of course, which are immune cells, and fat cells, but by metabolic consequences of circadian disruptions in one or more of these different tissues. So there are metabolic challenges and side effects linked with circadian clock disruptions in these tissues. So really important stuff. Definitely check out this article in the Oxford, uh, the Oxford's Endocrine Society Journal of Endocrinology. So um, this particular uh, uh, volume has a lot of, of you know, interesting um, detailed studies about this. So uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for hit, hitting that like button. And let's get to some of your live questions here. I'm grateful that you guys and gals are here. Uh, it's awesome that you're that you're here live. So let's dive into it. Okay, Shelby says your videos are very uh, instructional. Thank you, Shelby, for that. 
Julu says, uh, far north Alaska, some only have four hours of daylight. That is really tough. Now, so in extreme situations like that, you know, if you look at the opposite, okay, the people near the equator and things like that, do you eat 24-7? No. So we still need to, you know, sort of add in a little bit of, of restraints here. It doesn't mean that your feeding window is only four hours, but, you know, it also doesn't mean, you know, especially if you're in Alaska and you have sleep issues or seasonal affective disorder or depression, you definitely probably shouldn't be having like a bowl of ice cream at 11 p.m., Okay, so we need to understand that we use this as a gauge. It's not the only thing, but it's a, it's a big factor here. Okay, uh, Beyond Physical says, I eat raw meat, raw milk, and raw eggs. I would love to know how that's working for you. Thank you for being here and considering that. Uh, I, I have done raw dairy in the past. I'm not necessarily against raw dairy, but we also need to realize we're not baby cows, and I found that raw dairy gave me acne. And this is just my N of one thing, so I, I don't do it. We do raw dairy, especially goat dairy for my daughter. She seems to do well with that. She's growing. She's a young child. Uh, dairy is really interesting in that it's paradoxically low glycemic, but it's insulinogenic, meaning it spikes insulin. Now, we also know that meat and eggs and protein in general do raise insulin. It makes sense. Insulin is needed for the post-meal processing of those different amino acid-containing foods. So that's part of the the sort of nature's, you know, intelligence built into the human digestive system. But again, we do need to recognize and acknowledge the fact that there's something unique about dairy in that it, it more profoundly uh, spikes insulin compared to other uh, similar proteins. Um, but if it's working for you, then, then keep doing what works. There's obviously a lot of immunologic benefits, uh, you know, linked with dairy and, and things like that. Um, Okay, Bobby says, vitamin D is linked to uh, cholesterol. We need cholesterol in our skin cells to make vitamin D. You make a really good point. So cholesterol is a precursor for pre-vitamin D. And so, of course, if you're on a low cholesterol diet, um, you know that can lead to challenges, not only with just vitamin D, but also potentially hormones as well. We know that the cholesterol backbone is a precursor for a lot of different things physiologically. So great uh, there. Uh, Joshua Webb says, Just Joshua, thank you for being here, by the way. You were always here live with us, and that's amazing. I don't know about raw meat, but rare meat is good. Uh, the less cooked, the better. Joshua, I'm with you. Um, you know, again, I've had raw meat before. Uh, I've, I've done that out of necessity at times. For example, uh, when I was doing a carnivore experiment in 2019, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try a raw ribeye before this bike race that I did. Uh Honestly, it was just like out of necessity because I couldn't cook it, you know, in the situation because we had a long time. I had to get dropped off at like four in the morning up on this mountain and then race down uh, and had a lot of time there where I could eat, but but I couldn't, I, did, I had to have everything that I had on with me. So it was like, I just brought a, you know, really, uh, really good high quality grass fed local cut of ribeye and just ate it. Uh, and then I just let it digest and I had a really good ride. Um, so anyway, Joshua, I, I'm there with you, but quality really matters. Um, so that's important. Okay. I was gobbling the berries uh, in a nature park in Oregon and later that week in Tacoma, then blackberries were good. Yes, berries in season. It's hard to argue about intentionally avoiding those based upon your diet dogma. So I am 100% with you on that. Michael says, would you personally take supplements I think I'd find it impossible to get all the vitamins and minerals that some doctors recommend through my diet each day. Yeah, well, Michael, um, this is a phenomenal question. Uh, I've been taking supplements since I was about like 12 years old. So yeah, supplements can be important. I think though, to be honest, Michael, many people overdo supplements. Many of the clients that I work with, they're taking 12, 15 different products when we first start sort of talking. And I think a lot of people overdo it and depend upon them too much. There's a few staples that I recommend for people. First, starting out with the basics, like something like vitamin D and the essential nutrients. Iodine is really hard to get from food nowadays. Uh, so iodine, vitamin D, covering the bases there. Uh, just small plug, we offer those over at Myoscience uh, because they're really important, okay? Now, then I like to focus on you know circadian rhythm uh, balancing and then also sleep enhancement. So you can do sort of adrenal extracts in the morning and you can do something in the evening like L-theanine, taurine, GABA, things like that, glycine to support the sleep response. So again, these are solutions that are available anywhere on the internet, but we like to focus on some core issues when it comes to supplements and just really consolidate all these things over at Myoscience. So check it out. 
supplements. But not everyone needs these supplements, and it's honestly a good time when you travel, uh, whatever, just take a break from these things as well. So people overdo it. It's easy to overdo. I think they're very important, but I think we need to keep these things in context because what I see happening over the, over the years that I've been in this space now since 2006 is we start to, something gets exciting, something gets talked about, NAD, resveratrol, NR, NMN, whatever. And then so people are taking the vitamin D, they're taking their multi, they're taking a probiotic, they're taking a protein, they're, you know, and then all of a sudden they're like, wow, well, you know, this guy said M NMN, this guy said NR, this guy said take this and spermidine. And then pretty soon you're taking 15, 20 things. And you're like, well, I think these things are working, but I really don't know what's working or not. And I'm spending hundreds of dollars a month. So again, I'm not saying just throw them on the trash and never consider them again, but I'm saying um, it's easy to overdo. And we need to understand that there can be unintended harms from over supplementing just by virtue of, of the fact that these are highly concentrated. Uh, some of these are derived from nature. Sometimes there can be arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium, things like that, especially I'm not picking on vegan proteins, but I know a lot of people take a vegan protein shake because it has a greens blend and a probiotic and the whole kit and caboodle in it. Well, you know, some of those products are highly concentrated from rice and things like that. They can have uh, heavy metal. So again, I'm not saying they all suck. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but understand we need to come at this and, and be, use a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. Just say, I'm going to take all this stuff. You be, 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 you know, um, be precise about this. Cover the basics. Cover the vitamin D, the vitamin K, the iodine, you know, selenium, zinc, some of the basics, okay? Then start to focus on, okay, what's your weak point? Is it sleep? Is it hormone issues? Is it uh, your mind's racing at night? Is it you can't get out of bed in the morning because you have fatigue and circadian rhythm issues? So then start to then, you know, stratify from there. Okay, let's get into um, all of this. Okay, uh, Jan Lee says, are there any negative side effects associated with taking N-acetylcysteine, NAC, for a long period of time? Okay, let's talk about this. We've we did a whole video, and again, we, we've partnered with a company called Pure Encapsulations. We offer their uh, NAC glycine product. I, I really do quite like it. Um, when, do you take, when do you take glutathione precursors or antioxidants in general? You want to take those at night, friends. You want to take those after bed, in the evening, you don't want to take the antioxidants, polyphenols, vitamin C, all that during the day. Antioxidants are best dosed before bed, you know, in the evening, okay? We talked about that in the book, Belly Fat Effect, and we can get into that at another time and all the science on that. But what can you overdo the NAC? Well, what is NAC? NAC is an amino acid. It's cysteine. Cysteine happen to be, happens to be part of the three amino acids in addition to glutamine and glycine. So glutamine, glycine, cysteine are part of the, what's called the glutathione tripeptide. Glutathione is the most abundant antioxidant in the body. It is also involved in phase two detoxification. Uh, there, there's a lot of you know, ethanol uh, detoxification, all of these things. Uh, NAC is important. Now, can you overdo any amino acids? Absolutely. You can overdo histamine, histidine. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, glutamate, right? You can overdo that. So what's the sort of, you know, should you cycle it on, cycle it off potentially? Um, I, I would ask, you know, I think it was, was it Jan uh, that asked this question? Um, how long do you want to take it? Maybe you take it for six weeks, you take a two week break. Could you take it every day? I, I mean, I personally, especially when I go in the sauna and I'm moving things around after sweating, or if I, if I have a glass or two of wine, I do like wine on the weekends. I probably should just quit, quit alcohol altogether, but I do, I, quite like wine uh, on the weekend, you know, glass or two, I don't get hammered or anything like that. Biodynamic, organic, the whole thing. Um, you know, at, on those, in that situation, I'll take uh, a glycine NAC uh, powder, you know, afterwards uh, to help to mobilize some of the secondary byproducts associated with ethanol metabolism. So yeah, I think it's important, but can you, can you can overdo anything? You can overdo oxygen, you can overdo sex, you can overdo water. Okay. So I don't think most people need more than a gram or two a day, right, of NAC. So this is a great question. I appreciate that, Jan. Um, uh, Iron says, what kind of meat, uh, Iron Lion? You know, look, I know people buy chicken. I know people buy turkey. After having both turkeys and chickens for a number of years, I only eat red meat now. Like if we have a, a, a rooster that we harvest or whatever, yes, I will have that chicken. But most of the store-bought chicken, I'm not a big fan of that. So um 
elk, bear, you know, lamb, cow, um, that's sort of where we go for. And then also, of course, um, if you, if you raise animals here, so, um, we, I'm seeing some comments here about an individual who raises their own pork and lamb and, and chicken and all of that. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's important to know your source. Um, the thing about chicken and pork is they, they will eat anything. Um, having had pigs, uh, for a number of years and then having had chickens, um, you could put a dead body, they would eat it. You could put Skittles, they will eat it. You could put, um, marshmallows and chickens and pigs would devour it. It's harder to feed lamb and cattle, uh, these, you know, sorts of foods, right? <laughs> they eat grass or ruminants. Um, whereas these monogastric animals will essentially eat anything. They're omnivorous. So what that means for the consumer is unless you grow it yourself, you might be getting uh, an animal that has been fed a bunch of corn and soy, and you're you're you know that that doesn't have a lot of um, you know good uh, fatty acid profiles and, and all that. So, um, friends, I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for subscribing. Hopefully, you found some value out of this short-ish podcast uh, where we're live streaming. I'm not editing any of this. We're just sort of shooting from the hip, talking about some good stuff, friends. Uh, I'm grateful that you share this with, with a friend or family member. And I have some new research here. I've, I've been kicking around the idea of how to share it with you with regards to this new data about the spike protein being pathogenic independent of an infection. And I, I, I can't figure out how to make the content without irritating some of the digital uh, censorship but I have some good content coming for you. I'm working on it. Uh, I'm going to share it with you very, very soon. And uh, yeah, have an awesome rest of your day. We will catch you all soon. Take care now. Bye.